Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talk and Draw with Patrick Scullin and Travis Hansen and special return guest, Ben Rizbeck. Woo! Hey, everybody. Woo! <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Round two with Ben, the rematch. We're going to so see, nice. see how this goes. Um, excited to have you back. Of course, Ben is a talented illustrator, um, but also amateur archaeologist. <laughs> He's a cook yes. too. And a cook, yes, yeah. And yes, I mean, of a lunch bag drawer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, I gotta say, every time I'm trying to stick to my diet, um, Ben throws me off when I look at his Instagram. <laughs> the secret is I don't eat that. Stuff. Like I give it away, and that helps to. How do you do that? <laughs> I well, I, I, propor I portion it just enough for the people I'm with. So okay, there's maybe like a bite left for me or so. So if I don't, I will eat it all. It's, it's you have dangerous. amazing willpower, sir. That's <laughs> that's something special. But I don't live in that household. I'd be <laughs> pulling me out the door. <laughs> well, for for today's topic, we've decided to kind of talk about backstory and diving into detail and how we you know, flesh out and enhance characters. Um, and while we talk that, you know, Travis has a, a drawing subject for us. Well, we all have a drawing subject. It's just not me picking these out because I don't want, you know, someone to... <laughs> this is on you. I don't want someone to look at me and going, why did he choose that? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we did this in honor of Ben's great cooking skills. We're going to draw <laughs> cooking today, you know, whatever it can be. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with it. And uh, we'll start with me as, as, you know, we always start with me, but we'll start with me <laughs> and, and we'll have a little fun and uh, see where it goes. So let me uh, jump in and you can see my screen. Awesome. So while you're uh, getting your, your cooking set up there, Trav, um, let's start out with a question. Um, how do you guys add reality and detail to your art? And why is that important? So I can leap in here. I, I have some thoughts. I, I think uh, reality and detail, those are two different things. I think that the, the detail helps enhance the reality, but I think having a, maybe an understanding of what you're looking to create uh, goes a long way, whether it's, it's inferred or, or very realistic. Um, there's a, a Korean illustrator, Kim Jong-gi, I believe is his name, um, that he has a photographic memory uh, that he's, he spends his hours first in the morning looking at reference. And so he comes back and he can just pour out um, realism into his work. And that just connects you, at least for me, and I think a lot of people who see his work directly into, into that world. So it goes a long way to help sell whatever story you're trying to tell. That makes me just jealous. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the first time I saw him, he was at Comic-Con and he was presenting and people, he, he went right in with an ink pen and was just drawing things. And we all stopped and said, wait, how, what, where is this? Do you have an underdrawing that we're not seeing here? That's like 1% opacity. How are you doing? And he was through a translator. He let us know how he does this. And it's just, you know, he's put the time in to really understand how things work. So he can do, you know, complete um, blowouts of, you know, rotors and things on cars. And so he understands how those all work. And then when he throws that together into a, a motorcycle or something, it feels, you know, very, a very little, real. A little too real. That's, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I just don't know how you do that. I, I get, I don't have a photographic memory like that. He's, I think he's unique in this respect, but it's, uh, it's still really cool to watch. Oh, I bet it's totally cool to watch. So well, I guess, I think you're right, Ben, you know, detail is what gives reality to a, to a piece. Um, for me, I, I guess finding that reality is, um, is making sure that there are little things that, that give that, I don't know, that sense of place that, like it has a history. Um, if it doesn't have that, it just seems kind of flat and boring. Well, I think that there's also a, a, a difference sometimes. You know, you have people that try to, to make it so realistic. I, I think it's also a bit of a preference. And then you have those that realize that detail can be there 
but it doesn't have to overtake the entire picture. You know, you can allow someone's imagination to play a little bit and fix, you know, add the dots or, you know, connect the dots. And, and looking at like some of, you know, my favorite illustrators that used to do some of the, you know, the Asterix comics and the, um, some of the other European comics, uh, Mobius is another one, you know, there's detail there, but if you look, there's not detail there. There's an illusion that's created to enhance the, the viewer. And I think that that's, that's, you know, for me, that's kind of how I look at it, where I want to have, it to feel realistic and and when i'm talking about adding my detail I'm, I'm making sure that there's functionality in the room and stuff of that nature and then you have the detail of of all the little nooks and crannies and you know the texture i think there's many different multiple uh aspects of detail yeah i think that's true i mean for me i'm always looking for a reference what about you guys you make it up do you look for reference Depends on what I'm drawing or what I need to do. You know, yeah. I had I had a job the other day that I had to draw an actual race car, and <laughs> oh man, I had to go and actually hunt down reference because I don't really draw race cars. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Depending on what it is, I mean, there's enough muscle memory I think in a, a number of items that I routinely draw that I can fudge it. You know, I think. There's that's part of illustration. You don't have it doesn't have to be photo real. It just is the the illusion is there that it feels real and they they get it. Um, but yeah, I've I've had a couple instances, usually mechanically based as well, where I'm like, hey, draw this thing. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> yeah, I gotta go find something along those lines. And it, it you know usually there's the last couple ones I've done are usually motorcycles. So I did a, a, a chopper. You know, it was actually the um, Easy Rider. I used Easy Rider as reference, harkening back to um, oh, black guy names, Peter Fonda and. Do you use a, use a, a light box? No, no. This is this was digital. So that's the beauty of the internet. You kind of find some things and you go, okay, and this is the perspective that I want. So, um, so I was able to um, understand the anatomy of the, the motorcycles themselves, and then I. It wasn't meant to be, again, a photorealistic thing. So I sort of tweaked a little bit and added some stuff and made it a little post-apocalyptic. And so that you can, that's actually the beauty of it. You're not stressing so much about this doesn't look like a motorcycle, but once it becomes a motorcycle, then you can build onto that. Um, and it becomes enjoyable. Now, I think you made a good point about reference too. It's good to have it. And, and like if we were drawing a kitchen scene, sometimes you know, you're not in that kitchen and it's good to know what tools they use to help make it realistic or to, to give it that little bit of life. You know, whether it's a food mallet or um, making sure that the knives are correct or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever you need, uh, food, you know, even food, making sure that you've got a wide variety. You know, if you understand how a roast looks or what you like to put in a roast with like potatoes, you wanna make sure you got carrots and potatoes and some other veggies in there. So it makes it more like, a realistic um, that you you know what you're drawing <laughs> instead of just going yeah this is just a you know a half-hearted drawing and I want you to think that it's meat. <laughs> but I, I think the real fun of it is it once you sold them on what it is you know and the idea and we were talking about this prior to recording Travis a lot of your illustrations have those elements whether uh, and I'm assuming they're all intentional, the little Easter eggs that are tucked away, um, mm -hmm. that people, once they're there and they're consuming it, then suddenly they're immersed and they start looking and you, you find that you know, time blows past you as you're trying to really wrap your head around, what am I looking at? What is that? Oh, cool. And, and you know, your eye dances around the page, which is a lot of, a lot of fun as both the artists to create and as well as the, the viewer to really, you know, experience as well sorry i'm having a little fun here i'm enjoying my kitchen <laughs> <laughs> yeah and how does that then lead into kind of like character backstory like giving them um a history or well i think that depends on what you're given to work with too i mean if you're creating your own character um 
you know, as an artist, you can write down the stuff, but I like kind of drawing it. I'll draw like a, a certain thing on, on a character or a pouch or, you know, I, I give him a little bit of extra, I, I, the Easter eggs, I hide Easter eggs in there, which helps me mentally create a backstory for whoever I'm creating or drawing or working. But sometimes I'm given a script that I've got to work off of and they allow me to play a little bit. And that's that same thing. You've got to, to go, well, what, why does he have this hat? Why, how is he, why does he wear the hat? Why is he connected? Uh, and I'm amazed by how many times I've gotten a script and, and I've asked that question and, and the people look at me like, I don't know, he just wears the hat. And it's like, well, wait a second. There's got to be a reason because then you can do so much more with the story of what's going on. You can add things, you can hide things, you can really create. So even this character here, I have no idea who he is, but I want to have elements uh, on him that I can go, oh, you know, what would be his backstory? You know, what did he come from? And I'm already thinking of a backstory for the character already, uh, just by the hairy body and the tattoos. And, and I'm thinking of this, this chef on a boat. <laughs> like a, like a gnome cruise or something. Or a seedy, seedy hotel. But he started off as a sh uh, chef. <laughs> 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 but I don't know. I mean, what do you think, uh, uh, Ben? I mean, how does that? Because you created game characters a lot, yeah, so, so yeah. you have that same. Yeah, the the backstory. I mean, that that starts to get into the narrative. But the look of a character, I think, what you find comes down to really the I'll call it the asymmetry of the character. That was sort of from the, the technical perspective. Is how do you? If you only see a character running around from behind, how does it look different? And as you run up to different NPCs and you interact, what differentiates them from just a, a cut and paste across the entire world? Um, and depending on the technology that you have at hand, now obviously game dev has gotten just insane with what they're able to put out now as far as high poly count and the like. Um, so, so a lot of these issues are no longer issues, but back then you had to really uh, find ways to to make something stand out um, too. So I think yeah, the the details of a character, in the absence of true narrative in game, many games don't give you that, um, or it's linear and this other stuff is ancillary that they you just pick up along the way. Um, you have to be sort of smart about how that um, how that plays out too. So it's there's an economy of of um, resources that you're dealing with when you build those things, but it's also, um, again, a lot of fun. I think the more you can constrain yourself uh, makes it more challenging and therefore more entertaining to do. And when people respond well to it, that's also kind of a cool thing to see. Play well, you all, does it also apply with like uh, locations, buildings, uh, in, interiors? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, Again, if you're trying to, we come back to this idea of making something look like something. So, if, hey, I want this to look like, you know, downtown you know, Manhattan. And yeah, after the, the apocalypse has happened, what does that look like, right? And so you get the landmarks that people get, but now suddenly you have um, different things that are just, you know, the, the trappings of vehicles that are decimated and stores that are, you know, the mannequins or something, that sort of creepy vibe to it and the like. And again, there's so much that, that helps give people that immersive and that's really i think the key word is the immersion that you're looking for every little thing helps uh, yeah helps tell that story yeah and, and i want to add kind of to build on that too where it's like when you walk into a room having that uniqueness to the room of the uh, you get a chance to even understand the character even better you know because if that character is populated that room it might have stuff that another area or section wouldn't or another page wouldn't have so you, you're able to create um I, I used to call it that the world was its own character you know so if, if you can make the world just as alive as the characters were um you could really uh enhance your storytelling because now you have a whole new character that's a part of of your story that most people tend to neglect absolutely yeah So, um, so for example, on yours, Travis, you're throwing in all kinds of cool details, the, the stovetop, the, the background stuff. Um, 
are you drawing on experience with that or is that something just in the moment you're like, Hey, I just need to put a little something there. Well, okay. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, uh, like Ben, I like to cook. I like to cook a little differently than the way Ben <laughs> likes to cook. I, I like making, you know, jams. Meat. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Bring on the, but see, I have an understanding of that. So now when I'm drawing it, I know the right tools to put in the jam, you know, to put in the illustration. So if I was to draw a character that was canning, I know exactly how to set that up. Um, the other thing is, is I like to cook roast. I like to, to do, you know, uh, other dishes that, you know, I'm, I'm a heck of a carnivore, but I like to, I think there's a realism that I like to, to add to that where I can go, okay, yeah, I would cut a lemon and, or I might cut some pineapple here and throw that on there. Uh, I've got some veggies in here, maybe a carrot. Um, so now all of a sudden the, di the dish actually looks like a dish that was prepared, prepared for somebody that actually understands how to do it, you know? And I see that a lot. Um, I, one of my favorite shows is, is uh, Diners, Dives. And <laughs> Diners, Drive, and that, like, Yeah, uh, I, just, yeah. I just love watching people create. And then I go, okay, so because it helps me with my art. And I guess that's why I have so many kitchens in my art at times is because it's something that I, I gravitate to. Um, but I, I find that the same with when I'm drawing a forest. I like to, to go, okay, how does this look? How does this interact with each other? And I think that's super important in illustration to know um, where you're at. So for instance, if you were drawing a tundra scene, you need to have the right foliage and the right trees in the tundra scene. You can't just put any tree there you have to make it correct. Uh, the same with animals and fauna. You, you need to make it actually, if you're in a desert, you need to make sure your animals are designed to be, you know, desertish. So I watch a lot of National Geographic. I like, I like documentaries. So I'm creating stuff that can feel real um, because your fans will pick that up right off the bat. That if it's like, well, shoot, I live in the desert. Why do you have a fir tree there? That fir tree is impossible to grow there. And they'll call you out on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think too, it, it, it speaks to the idea that you really do need to experience life a little bit and research research. Yeah. And um, I always like, let's say take a vacation or travel somewhere. I always come back really inspired with different things that I want to put in my art somehow whether it's a scene or a memory or something, you know, having some sort of inspiration is always, always necessary. And whenever you feel like you're caught and stuck, you know, you got to kind of get out and do something. Well, one thing I've always liked and, and I completely admire this about you, Ben, is you go out a lot with your girls, you know, um, yeah. but the pictures that you take and the adventures, you find fossils, you give, credibility and i'll be honest there's moments where i go oh that's really cool i gotta figure out how to put something like that in my in my world or in, in awesome. what i'm creating and i and i think that's super important you know janelle and i we had to drive back uh we had to we had to leave and then we had to come back and we were driving through the mountains and, and janelle said i always used to just could see like faces in the mountains and she goes then i met you and then i started seeing all sorts of stuff in the rocks <laughs> You know, and, and, and I think that is, is the importance of the detail. What do you see? Um, or what are you allowing yourself to see? And, and I think the more research that you can get, the better off you're going to be. I mean, my favorite books are the photo books that I would find at the bookstores. I've, I've got one that's just nothing of trees, and it's different trees. And it's like one of my favorite books because now I can go, all right, I've never been to Madagascar, but I love the way that tree's drawn. How can I incorporate that design? into my illustration style. Yeah. Well, Travis, that's looking really well developed. Eh, a little bit. So we should probably switch. Okay. <laughs> no, everybody jump in. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. Can I dive All in? Right. Yes, All right. Yes, sir. Ready? Let's Here we go. Start got. the share. Okay. Let's do that. Start screen. Dang it. How's the, hey, how's the humidity out there in North Carolina right now? Uh, it's gorgeous. It's, uh, it's not any worse than Maryland was at the time. So it's, it's a little, I mean, obviously, as you can tell by my sunburn, it's been nice and sunny, but, and we're right by the ocean. So there's a, a real beautiful breeze going on here too. Oh, must be nice. I think we're close to a hundred again today. Oh man. 
It's a dry heat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it looks like we've got an old West. Yeah, I started while we were talking here. This is, you know, uh, so when we start thinking of cooking, um, the idea of how to approach this, it, you know, there's a number of ideas that popped into my head and I sort of came back to Cookie, you know, the, the camp chef and the, the infamous beans seen from blazing saddles and the like too so you know i uh, was thinking cookie from atlantis oh well is, uh, obviously that was a, a direct tip of the hat to all the wild west you know <laughs> shows how much that we've lard had. do you got <laughs> exactly exactly um so yeah so I decided to give him a roll and he's gonna have a, a little six shooter here in a minute <laughs> i love it so Looking at characters, um, you know, he's got a lot of personality, and um, I think Naj too. Yeah, yeah, I think those little visual details go into that that we're talking about. How do you give a character, or how do you make a character have personality, or give them, um, you know, whether it's visual interest or just personality traits? Um, what do you use as inspiration, Ben? Oh, that's a good question. I, uh, it really is what you're trying to emote, I think, too. So oops, if you're looking at the idea of, um, you know, different elements within the character that you want really to push. So if this guy is, you know, he's going to be sort of, you know, comedic. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Perfect. You know, for everyone, too. So, hey, we just Are you going to put a squirrel tail in that pop? Oh, uh, <laughs> see? Uh, a little coontail. Little coontail. <laughs> um, so, you know, you end up with however you want to have them play out, it ends up what you really push, too. So, uh, without fail, I think, again, and I might be wrong in this, and when you get into these different westerns, the, the camp chef has been really a joke, I think, in many ways. You know, it was a staple that was needed I'm, I'm trying to think even back to like city slickers and some of the, the ones that, you know yeah jack palance and like too is sort of a, a throwaway character in, in some respects but um you know still they also have the best personality the cooks are always some of the best characters right yeah and the ones that you you really gravitate towards um quickly and i think it's you know, food, the, uh, the idea that food is a driving force in the, the West was sort of part of that. Um, you know, you think of fun with Oregon Trail, right? And the idea that, hey, I had to kill a buffalo and what am I going to do with 200 pounds of meat? And I still die of dysentery. dysentery. <laughs> yeah, right? So, uh, so there's that communal component too. And if you really think about being in the, out in the West, I mean, this was a, life and death situation for any number of reasons for these folks. Um, and so I think this is one of those experiences that they allow them um, selves to really become human. And that's where, so while it's the character itself is comedic, he's, he's providing something that's not, it's a human necessity. And so it allows people to, to take away the bravado of the gunslinger you know, angry whoever in the mix, um, and you can work with that. Um, so I think that's, to answer the question, that's a long answer for the short question, but basically, what was that's that what statement? I <laughs> make a long story short. <laughs> yeah, <too late. laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's what I, that's what I lean towards at least is finding ways to, so this guy, you know, yeah, all those, those visual cues of Cookie from Atlantis and all these different films where it's this sort of goofy, um, Slim Pickens kind of guy, you know, is what sort of popped into my head. You know, one of one of my favorite chef scenes from from animation was um, Treasure Planet. Right. Yeah, and that was um, that was amazing. I mean, yeah, it was half digital, half traditional. Well, and so it was funny you said that because that was when talking to Patrick. That was probably going to be my next. If I didn't go with Cookie here, it would have been a Long John Silver's. Uh, I'm just sort of character, you know, um, design along the way too. But the cool thing about it was the food felt real when you were watching him cook. And, and I think that's the importance kind of what we're talking about 
is having the right amount of detail to make it feel real to make and it doesn't have to be real but to make it feel real and you know looking at what you're doing here with with cookie and 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 his great looks here and stuff like that it still has that feeling of he knows what he's doing especially because he's blowing on the food before he eats it yep you know and that to me it, it's those details that i gravitate to more than i gravitate sometimes to the texture details uh you know and if you there's another one thing if you look at like Mawazaki films i watched spirited away the other day that's got some great food pictures in it too oh my gosh <laughs> yes but there's a scene where sen goes out she goes and grabs her shoes puts it on and then pulls the back of the shoe so it would go over her heel so it fits right and then taps it and then takes off running and most people wouldn't even think to put that in they would just say okay she puts her shoes on and then off she runs but that little attention to detail shows that they actually understood the whole mechanics of this kid you know and her personality Absolutely. And that's so I think that comes back to the idea of, of reference. Um, you know, infamously Disney, if you if you go back prior to Snow White, um, and I think if I remember correctly, this, I, I saw this, and I'm going to paraphrase how they talked about it, but it was basically they, they did a demo that was not rotoscoped. Um, and for those of you at home who don't know what rotoscoping is, is basically filming live action and, and animating over top of that. Think Lord um, of the Rings, Ralph Bashke, 1970. Oh, that, well, <laughs> didn't he, he ran out of budget, I think, too. So that, that's that why was he did it. <laughs> psychedelic thing, half of it, yeah. Uh, but you, you look at the motion, if you go back and watch Snow White, I believe it was the first film that Disney did with that technique. Uh, it, it, night and day difference, and then, you know, Sleeping Beauty and the like, the two that started to capture the nuances of human motion. Now it's a shorthand, right? So as an illustrator, we don't we're not relying on that, but animators and the like still, you know, kind of look to those sorts of things uh, in many ways. And it, it's those little things. So I, I have no doubt that Miyazaki uh, would have filmed a little kid putting shoes on and really looked at that and go, okay, that's. You're going to go back and look at that now next time you watch I that. can picture it. I can picture what you're talking about. Yeah, that whole is one of my favorite films. Uh, right. And, and it's the scene where she first goes out to see her folks. So she goes down and they, because the sits had her had her shoes. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think that's an important thing to to recognize though is that people might think, oh, they they just invented that out of their mind. No, they they were careful to observe real life and and pay attention to those little details. And you have to do that. You can't just make it up. Yeah, no, I think it's. And they're, they're, what was great about some of these pieces too, and what I loved about Spirited Away, because I've, I've watched that enough to really try to delve into the food in particular. Uh, <laughs> that you, I mean, the Asian culture has, I mean, food, I mean, many cultures, food is a big deal, but in the Asian, in Asian cultures, food is central in many ways. Um, and there's just some remarkable, in, in uh, South Korea, they have a whole, show uh like a, a drama focused on food i want to say it's like let's eat that's what it's called or something that it basically <laughs> it's a drama you know relationships love triangles all that sort of stuff and yet they all come back to like a restaurant and they're like slurping noodles and it's the like close shots of this you know stuff that just looks so delicious too so so uh, Net netflix has an anime that you might want to check out ben okay they, they hunt dragons and then they give you each time they spend at least Oh, a good scene or two on how to cook the dragon meat. And it's just amazing. You throw the herbs what? in and the spices. And, What's and the, the show called? Oh, my gosh. If I could. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me look. Well, you guys go ahead. I'm going to look. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> That's right up my alley. For sure. it's, 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 I walked away going, man, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say my, my favorite cooking show on Netflix is Nailed It. Have you seen that one? <laughs> is that the I, one where they screw it up? Yeah, they bring in amateurs to try to make oh, I can't watch that. That, that would, professional be, that would be stressful, yeah. I can't. <laughs> it's so funny. But see, that, those are the kind of shows that I can't enjoy. Like the all the Ben Stillers, like Meet the Parents, where things intentionally go wrong. That's just torture. I don't know why people would really respond to it. So I, 
that's not my my cup of tea here. Well, um, you know, kind of related to what we've been talking about, what is it that makes make characters interesting and you know avoid being bland and boring? You know, this guy's face is really interesting, and why is it? Why does it work? Well, I think the reason, from my perspective, um, and now this, the, the cookie theme, if you will, has been done a number of times, right? And, and so the bushy beard and the hat, I mean, it's almost I'm parodying what has been done in the past, um, but I'm, I'm intentionally exaggerating some features and to like just to give it a little, and he's got a, a comically large head in proportion to his body, right? So. Um, that gives you a sense of whimsy that is not, I mean, I could go for like a photorealistic, here's this man, let's you know, find reference of an old gentleman hunched over, okay, let's use that. I mean, and that's a way to go. Um, but that's not sort of coming back to that comedic value and that element that I'm looking for is not the way I really wanted to go. So, um, you know, for me, that's, that's how I ended up, at least with those proportions looking intentionally the way they did to give you something you know that's not that's not human anatomy exactly but it's not you know not completely wrong totally well and that's that's one of those things i always wonder in situations like like this character it's called drifting dragons <laughs> okay. Drifting dragons i have never heard of it i will no it's them. actually it's pretty cool it, it caught me off guard. I was like, oh, I, I like that. Drifting dragons. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Sorry, I didn't mean <laughs> Sure. What, what, I was getting at was, what I was getting at is uh, what's interesting is a character like this, this iconic character. Who was the first one to make that character? And then everybody else followed. You know what I mean? I think about that with like all kinds of Hollywood films where you get these tropes, these ideas that just persist. And who was actually the original, the originator of that? And the Greeks. Well, no, I'm talking well, about like movie like characters. The Wild like, West. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you could go back pretty, pretty easily. I, I'm tempted to do this now. Yeah, like um, figure out who was the first actor that really pulled this off, and yeah, and, everybody else built on it. Well, yeah. uh, and maybe that's like a John Wayne film of some sort. They might have a, a character. Yeah. like that. But that's, I think, the hard thing is how do you make the character your own? You know. You can have the, the the feel of the the stereotypical that we've seen over and over again, uh, but how do you make that character your own? How do you add a little pizzazz to it? I mean, even looking at this character, is the arrow? You know, does he keep the arrow in his hat because he's always been that way? You know, he was shot at years ago when he was a kid, and he's like, "Ooh, I like this little arrow. I'm just gonna wear it forever." You know, um, you can almost hear his voice. Hey. Yeah, yeah, with that little twang. But it's, I think part of it, though, is because we've talked about, you know, the different, uh, you know, voices or from the different movies. You know, you see that. Uh, Slim Pickens. Slim yeah, yeah. Pickens, a great voice. I love that. <laughs> but, but even if I was to take Cookie, that was, um, oh, what was his name? He was the dog also in uh, um, uh, Toy Story. Um, it's oh, 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 um, Burn. Ernest. 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 Yeah. Uh, Jim Varney. Jim yeah. Varney. Yes. Right. So you can see those voices come out, you know, that, uh, of different I didn't know he was Cookie. Was he Cookie? In, yeah, in he was Cookie. Was that like his last role? Um, that... No, it was one of his last roles, though. Oh, wow. So he was Cookie in Atlantis? Is that yeah. What Oh. But you can see the, you know, you can hear it in the voice. And I think that's what, you know, how do you, I guess the question would be, how do you take something that's so overused and make it your own? How do you give it life to, to make it fresh and different? Well, I think in, I mean, we're referencing animation, which is difficult in its own right, but I think there's some, they, there's some cheats that they have, so to speak, because they have a script and they have character development that goes along with it. But if you're talking about a singular illustration uh, or even in sequential art with a handful of illustrations along the way, uh, it's, it's definitely picking those moments that people really lock into. So if I, if I remember Cookie from Atlantis well enough, he was just sort of a little crazy 
a little crack pot, you know, and, but he was, he would make anything out of anything. If I remember, again, I might be. His favorite really thing was lard. <laughs> yeah. And so you get these things that sort of play into it and these different other characters will, you know, Hey, I can cook anything as long as it's beans kind of thing. Right. And so you, you, but they're also pulling, that's what's really remarkable is that they're pulling from history too. So if you were to really go back and look at these camp chefs, what made them who they were, like this, this sort of trope didn't come out of thin air. Well, and if you take the character of Cookie himself, too, I mean, he had a huge tattoo of the world on his chest, and and he had his, you know, he kept lard for the whole trip that he would give to somebody at the end of the trip because that was important to him. So you have all of these little details that create the character, and that gives him that uniqueness, you know, and I think that's where even in game design and stuff like that, you created details on characters that even though the viewer might not ever know why you added that, that cross or why did you add that pouch or whatever, or that design style, you've already built a backstory for that character. Absolutely. Yeah, no. Well, and I was going to say, uh, Travis, you must be the leader of the Atlantis uh, fan, um, club here. fan club. No, right? no, no. <laughs> um, I think the character design the the story could have been just a little bit more, but if you look at the art design by Magnola, that is beyond. That's some of the best art design. I didn't, I I didn't know he did that. He didn't. He he didn't do all of it, but they they leveraged a lot of. He did some, and they leveraged his style. Like the hands was a big thing. Like the hands were his. And certain the way they designed certain characteristics of of the faces and the features, they just had that flair that that he has. Wow, you just you just. Uh made that movie for me Blew your <laughs> yeah that's like whoa <laughs> you got you Michael Fox and Leonard Nimoy in there I mean that's a that's a good film yeah you, I, you, I need you to go revisit under, that movie you live under a rock <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was, it, it was a Disney film that kind of came and went for some folks I think, yeah too, yeah so. I, I missed missed Cause, out on that because they didn't have a real princess that people could gravitate to she was too strong in that movie or I don't know she might well, have been. It just kind of reminds me of the uh, Treasure Planet. They were trying to do, you know, different adventure stories. and Yeah, but those monsters could really needed some help. <laughs> I, had problems, in... I had problem with the aliens in Treasure Planet. They just, the design. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, they felt very one-dimensional character designs. See, that was another thing that was, I loved about Atlantis was the Leviathan, too. Do you remember that sort of oh. robotic? lobster that guarded the entrance like that, that was, was amazing yeah it was such a, a throwaway piece but it, it stuck you know I, I went back and googled that to try to like let me see you know it was on screen for a couple seconds of that you know um, and i th and i think that's the the key you know as you look at it you're going to gravitate to all these different things and go how do i take this and put it into my artwork how do i take this and put it? and it's okay to do that you well know? i was to to lead off that i was going to say that that is one of the secrets, I think, to adding detail and personality is take something from somewhere else, inspiration from something else, and bring it into something that's never been done before. Or try to, uh, to mix and match things that maybe didn't belong together, but now do and create something interesting. So, you know, you know we're talking about all of these, these things and where we get ideas. This isn't something new um about putting it into your work whatever it whether it be writing or art or or anything i was reading on jules verne uh 20, leagues under the sea mm -hmm. and they're talking about you know his inspiration came from a real sub that was designed in france in the 1850s that could hold 12 men yeah, didn't I feel like they all died aboard it or something? No, no, they lived. <laughs> did, did, these guys oh, lived. They? Okay. These guys actually, they could go down thirty meters in this in this sub, oh, wow. and and, oh. and it had, and it was huge because they had to put all the air into it. You know, they had so much air that they had to put into it, and and the, the biggest problem that they had was every time they would launch the sub to go underneath, it would always be that uh, the nose it would the nose would go down and hit the ground first because they were. Oh, going in, in the in the thing but you know that's where he got his inspiration from and i think that's the importance of having references or a sketchbook and going out and looking at stuff you know 
you'll, you'll find stuff in everyday life that can inspire you and to hunt down those little extra details um, to make it realistic. You know, when you read about the Nautilus uh, in Charles Verne's book, he bases it on, it's pretty accurate for life in a sub uh, that didn't come around for 50 years or 60 yeah. years. You know, and I think that's where we get as creators get to play like that. We get to design and go, you know, maybe this will this will end up somewhere else. I mean, if you look at Star Trek, same thing. How much of that tech that we saw in the 60s is kind of realistic nowadays? Yeah. You know, you, know, you, you talk about the Nautilus. That, in Disney's version of 20,000 Leagues in the Sea, uh, with Gregory Peck, right, his Nemo. Um, I think it's... Um... Oh no! Was it Kirk? Kirk, Kirk Douglas. No, well, Kirk no. Douglas was the um, he was he Ned. Was a sailor, yeah. Gregory he was the Peck harpoon was, guy. Gregory Peck was Nemo, I believe. I'll have to go back and look. Um, that, won a, that won an Oscar for art design, I think. Did it? It, sh oh, it does not surprise me because that was to say the design of the Nautilus alone is just, and that you see that even echo back in Ant uh, Atlantis and their their sub as well, but. Um, you know, and then having it at Disney World for uh, Disneyland for so many years, um, that that design taking it. You know, if you go back and look at um, some of the illustrations in uh, the original Jules Verne, it, it didn't have anything quite as exotic, I think, as what Disney came up with. But it it really is burned into my brain whenever I think of you know any sort of steampunk anything underwater it's like that's my go-to <laughs> like the exposed rivets you know and the 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 spike uh sort of crest over the the you know bulbous eyes of the viewing ports um you know it was it was such a great a great thing well you know another thing that if you look at it, a more recent film that came out and its attention to detail and style uh was to me is, is amazing is klaus you watch that? I've not seen that yet. No. Oh my oh, goodness! The, Those the, Santa Claus, uh, the Netflix Santa Claus movie. Yeah, and it's not really. I mean, it is a Santa Claus movie, but it's not. It, it's it's and the art design is all traditional. Uh, and and Pascal got to work on that. Um, oh. Um, hmm. And stuff, but it's if you go look at the art design, it's it's pretty amazing. They got a fishmonger scene that's that's pretty awesome. I, I'm just like, Oh my goodness, that's just gross. But, um, you know, and I think that's, that's, I, I love, so for me, I love looking at what other artists or creators do. I like watching how they put detail into stuff or how uh, an anime or an animation is created. And I go, how do I, how do I do that? How do I add that element into my work? That's why I like Malazaki's work so much is because there's so many little details that you can put it put in and fill your illustration with that give it so much more life yeah well this guy's really coming alive ben He's all right thank you, thank you. Need... Yeah, let me yeah let's see patrick's here i'm gonna stop sharing okay it's it's not that impressive <laughs> let's let's uh let's see what we got here so um Pretty, pretty hey. average, <laughs> average hobbit cooking some dinner. I don't know. I was trying to. Hey, Bilbo loved to cook. Trying to be silly, but uh, I just, I after I've gone through this, I started thinking, oh, maybe it would have been funnier if he was um, like in in Smog's cavern, making him cook him dinner or something. You know, like have him shooting Holding fire. up something, yeah, and roasting <laughs> something for him. But I didn't have I didn't think of that at the time, so, so I was like, okay, I'll just stick with this. But um, just trying to we're 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 playing against what I like to draw, guys. I don't I don't really like drawing environments. I don't like <laughs> I I don't, I don't like drawing rooms and buildings and stuff. Hey, you could have drawn a piece of beef, and everybody would have been happy. <laughs> I should have just drawn a double double or something. You know. What this makes me think, I love what you've got here. First of all, that this this actually, strangely enough, is evocative to me of uh, one of my favorite um, animated, uh, or not animated, well, illustrated books, um, The Wind in the Willows. 
Oh, oh. yeah. And I was like, so that book, I had it as a child and I lost, it was destroyed and I went back as an adult and found it. It was the uh, version from, and I want to say it was, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. Was it Kenneth Graham? Um, who illustrated it, but it was, it was the Australian version and I'll have to find it. It's, it's huh. the, there's a double page spread of, you know, badger, toad, and rat, uh, um, retaking, Toad Hall or Toad Man, you know, and and again the detail in these environments uh, were, and there were these watercolor paintings, but they were really dialed in. Have you seen Dave well, Peterson's reversion of that? I have, I have, and his, no. his stuff is, uh, you know, Dave does Mouse Guard, right, and, and other, so it's sort of up his alley with the anthropomorphic. But it's range. gorgeous. Same thing. Yeah. The attention to detail, you know. You know I don't know if. I don't know if it's the same one, but I remember as a kid, I had one with a frog and toad. Were those? Oh, oh, f um, I know what you're talking about. Frog and toad, I think, was its own series. Okay, because they were like watercolor, light. It, it wasn't Wind in the Willows. That was a different series. Okay. Frog yeah. and toad. I had those, and when you mentioned it, Ben, that was immediately what I was thinking as a kid. I remember these, these really nice ink illustrations with light watercolor. Reminds me kind of maybe Winnie the Pooh style. Yeah, there's there's a whole uh, era of people who've done these yeah. things. But what really, it, it's the English. That's what I really loved too. Is even Mole uh, had he had come back to his uh, burrow and he was opening it up and dusting it off and he had these. You know, I, I still want one of those. Uh, I guess they're captain's beds, like built into the wall that you can sleep in. You know, <laughs> like it just the and he had uh, herbs and garlic hanging from the ceiling and pot. Like it just had this country. I was telling my daughters this too. Like I my go to if I had all the money in the world, it would be a little English cottage somewhere that had all those trappings of um, kind of what you have illustrated here. That giant hearth with the the stonework and the you know pots up top and. Um, just that yeah. warm, homey feel. Yeah, little yeah. hobbit, hobbit hole. Yeah, so I think you're getting that. Uh, you're getting that there too. What would be really cool and to think about is the, and this is what I loved even in th throw this little curveball with um, one of my favorite movies, Hook. Uh, yeah, and with Robin Williams, and, you know, and they were doing all the imaginary food, right? And, and oh he, yeah, he, he oh started, yeah. He finally, he finally got it. And suddenly, all this food shows up. You go back and watch that scene. Most of it looked like, uh, you know, clay, colored clay that they're throwing at each other. But it was just this: the color palette of food was uh, off the charts. And so that was sort of a thing that I kind of go back to in my head of ways that they took. What does food look like in Neverland? It could have just been your typical, yeah, like a steak or a turkey or a whatever. But they well, made it this really bright yellow and red and blue that you know, kids were missing with. So. We talk about the need for detail and we go back and we look at some of these masters or some of the, the creators. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite comic strips is uh, The Adventures of Nemo and Slumberland. And you look at that detail from the 30s and the layouts and the way they designed, he designed those pages and built them when comics actually had a place in the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, absolutely gorgeous. The other thing I was thinking, you know, we're talking about the importance of design and elements and backstories. I think one of the greatest examples would definitely be um, the Dark Crystal. Sure. Oh my gosh, yeah. And and he got to the point where when he was building, he was building ecosystems. That's yeah. Brian Froud, right? Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. that's amazing. And before we pass by, what was the name of the cartoonist that did uh, Nemo and Slumberland? Um, oh, I can't even Ooh. remember his name. Hold on. I'm trying to think. Because he also did the first real animation, right? Yeah, he did the dinosaur Birdie one. Birdie the dinosaur? Yep. This is a little history lesson today on uh, Talk and Draw. Well, you know, I think it's important. We talked about this before about uh, the masters and talking about the guys that inspired us and, and got us to think outside the box. Um, the Little Nemo, uh, that was done by Alexander Braun. No, I don't think so. 
Uh, Windsor McKay. Windsor McKay. There, there it is. is. Yeah, there it is. Windsor McKay. Second name. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was just looking at it. And I'm actually, I pulled it up and I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm looking at the art right now going, wow, wow, wow. And, and yet, uh, you know, you look at another creator that really just built stuff in would be Will Eisner. I mean, sure. his detail. And I'm not talking about so much the spirit. If you look at his books that he wrote about New York and growing, you know, growing up in the different communities that were there and the amount of detail that's in there um, and how he hides stuff in there. That's amazing. That, oh, talk about inspiration to walk away from. Well, and talk about master. I mean, Will Eisner, you know, is really, I think, set the tone for many folks and uh, on how you deal with the art of sequential illustration and what that looks like in telling those stories too. And so the idea that he some of the stuff that you read, I actually gave his book um, on sequential art to my daughters to read um, and they were pouring over it. And we actually were talking about how time, you know, how you show time being illustrated. And my nine-year-old remembered the scene that he had of the water dripping that you can kind of tell the passage of time by those sorts of things too. So he found a way, he, he transcended so much beyond just trying to represent something on the page, but he was getting into you know, the passage of time in three scenes and did it, you know, beautifully. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like this, Patrick. You're doing a good job. Well, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> you can pay me later. No. <laughs> <laughs> so is he taking the break? He's, is he, is he, or is he, he's thinking dreaming gonna... of what's going to be done? Well, or? Yeah, he's, um, I was just trying to think, you know, second breakfast, he's working on, so don't, don't, take, don't take this wrong because i think this is awesome i will take it wrong actually Please don't. Please so don't. I, I don't actually take critique well he reminds <laughs> me of bob hope <laughs> he does you're right i see the that yeah, you, you, just gotta, you just gotta hook the nose a little bit <laughs> yeah. road to yeah Hobbiton, it's, right? it's the new the new buddy road to the shire yeah him and uh, Bean Crosby, the little. Well, so, and, and looking at this, you know, I like what you're doing. And, and <laughs> I think something that we see here too, even though we're, we're, we're right, is you're already working on the lattice on the pie. You know, you've yeah. got the lattice in there and that's important to see. And, and, you know, looking at the meat, you know, what are you going to, you know, how you've got the meat, you got a ham hock and you can see the. Turkey legs. And the the little, in, yeah. You know, I think that's, that's, that's what we're talking about is these details. And then you've got to ask yourself, how do I make it even more, um, just more than just a simple. Yeah. Like, how do you take it to 11? Right guys. Take it to 11. Uh, it up to 11. Well, and, nice. and taking this it to 11, <laughs> taking it to 11 might be adding marrow to the bone or the marbleization of meat. When you look at meat, it's marbleized by the fat, you know, and all the different things. It's, it's, it's like a tree. You know, the thing that I, I find, and this is actually where the arrow came in with my guy, because it's, I think what's really cool uh, about what illust a singular illustration can do is obviously you're looking at a snapshot in time, right? Like this is the moment this person is doing this thing. But what I really love to do, and I forget to do this at times, but if you, mm -hmm. if you can find ways to do this, and this might be something to think about, um, is that you're you're looking ahead, right? So you're, there's the anticipation of this feast. You got all this food, but when you talk about it being second breakfast, right? They, uh -huh. in my mind, I kind of go, okay, well, what happened to first breakfast, right? And so yeah. that's where, if behind him were like the, the sink, if you were to have pile dishes piled up, right? Um, and he's like, I don't even have time for this. I'm already working on my next meal here too. The, those moments before and after the, the snapshot that you're looking at. Yeah, there we go. Those volumes, I think, of, of what's happening. Well, that was something I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about, you know, um, Jim Varney and voice actors and stuff. And we don't have the benefit of a voice actor. You don't have the benefit of sound effects or. You're doing your head. Things. <laughs> well, well yeah, and well, that, yeah, yeah that's kind of the point is um you have to give those visual cues because you don't have the benefit of of audio visual cues so these little details like adding the stack of dishes um the crinkles in the guy's nose you know these things are are what evoke that 
soundtrack in your mind, right? And I think that's really important for an artist to tap into is find those little, those little cues, those little callbacks that then play that audio track in your mind and, and, you f and the audience fills in the gaps, right? Well, I'm waiting for him to tell a joke in Bob Hope's voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like that. but when you see it, I mean, even when J.K. Rowling um, wrote Harry Potter, she said that she always had Alan Rickman in mind for Snape, yeah, you know, and, and the personality and the voice. And honestly, when I read the books, whose voice do I hear when his speaks is actually Alan Rickman's. Well, I'll tell you, like, well, I, we literally just watched um, the first movie again two nights ago. And yeah, Alan Rickman blows it away as far as that character. But even uh, we've listened <laughs> Sorry. regularly. He put a golf club in his hand. <laughs> Bob can Hope I, open here. Yeah. Can I play through? <laughs> but go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, but then even Stephen Fry. So we, I have all the books on tape. Uh, and Stephen Fry does such a, a great job in his own voice, but it still is evocative, I think, of, of Alan Rickman in many ways. Although mm -hmm. I'm not sure the timing of how that was cast. Maybe it's just coincidental, but or my brain's connecting the dots. But um, yeah, there's some roles that they cast you know, without anyone else in mind. You know, School of Rock, Jack Black kind of comes to mind, you know, this idea that obviously his friend, um, Michael White, wrote that story with Jack Black in mind. So you're like, there's no way if I were to take Jack Black out of School of Rock, would that well, movie ever work, you know? Well, looking at this, and, and you made a great point, thinking ahead, you know, and I think, you know, as we build these illustrations or we build these, these creations and you're looking at detail, the comment is, well, what happened to the first breakfast? Well, now he's adding the first breakfast. And it really adds to the story of the picture that's being told. It's adding a whole nother level. Um, and now, to me, by even adding the golf club, which we did in, in fun, takes the piece to another level going, it's like, all right, I got to work that appetite up for second breakfast. I'm going to let this simmer and cook while I go hit a couple rounds. Yeah. I guess and, so I was, and I was just thinking he's using his putter here to – to grab stir, the, the stir, yeah. <laughs> well, now see, if you were going to use the putter, I would put half the putter in the pot. But <laughs> you know, I, I, but it's still anything that you can do to tell the story. I think is what makes yeah. you know the piece well. How how many stories can you? When I look at an illustration, and I guess maybe this is why you stopped, Ben, when you looked at. And I know which one you're talking about. Actually, you're talking about the one with the dragon underneath the mountain, and um, the wishing well. Um, I wanted one of the things that like as I would draw a scene, my goal was how many stories or individual stories could I tell with that picture um, that the reader will find? You know, there's always more than one. And and sometimes when people draw, they only draw the the one story that they see. Okay, he's cooking and he's stirring the pot. And they miss the point of there's so much more happening in life. How much more can I add to the scene to create a secondary story or a third story? or a fourth story. And that's where the detail comes in. That's where you add things. That's where you, you add a whole nother element of, of, of adventure or looking ahead to the piece, you know, and that's where having resource would be so important. You know, you look at, you make, you want your kitchen to be right. Well, what do you put in the kitchen? Do you put the bare minimum or do you really fill the kitchen out? And I honestly, I've been in kitchens where, they're not clean. They're messy. They've got food. They've got, you know, that's why all my illustrations with kitchens are messy because it's what I'm used to. But there's so many different stories that are telling and looking at this, I can see three or four stories. And is that a golf ball on the table now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's another element of the story. You got a hobbit that likes to golf. The, and one thing that I, I, I think you're right, I mean, as we're pulling from these, one thing I, I struggle with that I'll throw out there as, uh, as a former concept artist and, and character designer, really, and I find myself, I had someone actually ask this question, like, all your, like, I, I'll do the sort of three-quarter illustration of a, uh, of a character, and because it's sort of meant to be able to then be handed off to a modeler to build and then be implemented into a game. So you get these... Uh, it's the sort of the, the quickest shorthand of a character design to, to do. So you don't necessarily, it's a very different world than a, a, a 
illustration telling a story, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's times in my sort of wind down, I just sort of will, you know, He-Man is kind of the one I've been going to lately of the difference, you know, Trapjaw and Skeletor and things. And so it's fun to kind of experiment and do just those characters because that's kind of what I know, but taking that out. Uh, and so for me, what I, the questions I have here, and that's why I was asking you about what is he thinking, is how is this character coming all the way back around to that thing I said at the very beginning, how is he emoting? Like what, where are you, what are you catching him right in this moment? And so, you know, yeah, he's thinking about this relaxation and it's going to be great. Or, you know, could you have him like panicking, looking at this, recipe going and it's you know there's there's a hundred items on it and i don't have the thing that i need you know um there's any number of ways that the person viewing it can connect to what they're looking at um and then yeah and then so they can details. see themselves somehow in that yeah they've they experienced go, that panic or they've yeah felt that pressure i know what that is okay he's panicking why is he panicking and so then you start to look around and go oh my gosh he hasn't done all the dishes oh my gosh he's got 20 things he has to cook He's got all this other thing, or you could have, you know, you need flour and his flour jar is broken or, you know, he's missing something crucial, you know, uh, or it's, you know, again, there's all this, these, and that's, I love what you're saying, Travis, that I had never thought of that, that having an illustration be a crossroads for the viewer uh, on any number of narratives. You know, I think most, myself included, struggle with getting the one narrative, you know, tied into it. But if you're able to have multiple uh, streams in there that they can kind of take it and, and deviate from is is pretty cool. Yeah, I, it's it's. I mean, and that's kind of when I look at other people's art. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm looking for that deeper story. You know, uh, Will Stout's a great one to look at. You look at Bill's work, and there's a deeper story in there. You just have to find it. Uh, Sergio's the same way. We reference Sergio a, a lot here. Mm -hmm. But when you go look at Gru, how many side stories can you read in the Gru comic? I mean, there's so many other elements that are happening that connect in different stages. And, and I think, you know, that's where the genius in storytelling is, is how do I, you, I how many levels can I put within a, a, a comic or an illustration or a piece of animation? How many different levels can I put in there? And how many people are gonna catch the different levels? Yeah. The, the one thing that I would reference here, and I, I highly recommend it if you've never read it or seen it, is a book called The Mysteries of Harris Burdick. Have you guys ever come across No, this? I haven't. No. Hmm. So it's by uh, Chris Van Allsburg, the guy who did Jumanji. Oh, and yeah. Uh, and it's this, it's amazing. It's a, a picture book, basically. He wrote it or did it in 1984. And the concept is that, um, if I remember correctly now, the the artist is, it's the one of those things where the artist found these illustrations and he's presenting them to you. And so this, uh, this guy came with samples to, to sell a picture book uh, and the publisher liked him, but then he never came back. And so all they have are these sort of fragments of a story. Um, and it's, the book is remarkable because of the just single illustrations. So for example, there's one that has a ha literally a house with it looks like rockets it's like the house is just lifting out of place or there's uh you know a, a stairway down into a basement and there's like a little gnome door like set in the wall um and there's a, all these series of these little illustrations and what's really cool about this book is that it's been used um and i'm not i'm not going to do justice to who used it but it's it's been on a national level this book has been used these illustrations have been used as story starters Mm. Um, for creative writing contests and um, they're black and white like they almost look like charcoal sort of the Chris Van Ellsberg style if you look at Jumanji yeah. it was very you know simple that way um, but it's so great that you kind of look at this and go oh what what's behind that gnomish door that little door in the, the thing or the um, there was one of those uh, wallpaper that had birds on it and one of the birds was literally lifting off the wallpaper to fly out a window you know? Oh, how cool is that? Yeah, so I look it up. I mean, I have it. I, I pull it out from time to time, and the girls and I look at it because it's such a great thing that you send go. Send it this to me. I'll send it. I want to go buy it. Yeah, this one illustration can is has prompted thousands of story ideas because he left it intentionally nebulous. So it really tells the power, I think, of a single illustration to to jumpstart 
the minds of others in, in ways that we don't typically think about. It's very, very cool. I love that. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. All right. I'm going to turn off my Bob Hope Hobbit. All right. Jump call him Bob back. Hobbit. Bob it. Bob it. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> So, are we doing a two-hour video tonight? Just I'm curious. What's the? How no, no, I think we're uh, <laughs> we're getting close. I think we're actually about to wrap up here. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, um, let's uh, let's do one more question, you guys, and uh, yeah. then sign we'll jump, off. We'll have, we, we want to jump on his last piece too. So, yep. You got to make sure you sign it and everything else. So, this is mine. We'll finish off with that. <laughs> Mine is nowhere near as complete as yours. So. Yeah, what do we what do we call yours, Travis? I don't know, but I'm going to ink it up later and make it a comic uh, coloring page. <laughs> Looking good. Thank you. All right, Ben. Yeah, well, I'll go back to mine here just to show you. I, I have been talking and not illustrating as much as I what should. What the heck? <laughs> no, that's all good. It's good. Yeah, we hooked in here too. So I've I keep going back to refine it a bit further too. So this is where I've, I've left it, but it's, it's one that I think I'll, I'll continue after we're done here for sure. I'm enjoying your line work on this one. So am I. Yeah. I like yeah. the, the way you're working on the shadow above his brow and stuff. I think that's. Yeah, going back and putting some. I like that. Cast shadows along the line. So um, just as our, our final question, just to think about you guys, uh, we always ask, why do you make art? But um, he already answered that. Exactly. So the question is, why, <laughs> why else do you make art? <laughs> I forget my original answer. I don't say I will. So, let's, oh. so we're just going to hit you with, you can respond to it or add to it. You know, yeah, what, yeah. what about art? Uh, so I, I think I find us to be very fortunate uh, as artists and, and anyone in a creative uh, field to be able to share, I think everyone, and this is gonna sound somewhat philosophical, so I apologize in advance, but the idea that as humans, we're always looking for ways to connect with each other, right? And especially in the, in the climate we're in today. Uh, I think that's more important now than more than ever. Uh, and I think uh, as we've seen, we've talked about any number of masters and, and they had no idea that they would be connecting with three uh, you know, young fellows, uh, that have seen their work and have connected with it along the way. And so I think that's part of the, the human desire to connect with others and uh, you know, being able to share that and see the reaction from others as they, uh, as they dive into our work is, is admittedly selfish. Um, it, it's, it's fun to have. Uh, and it's therapeutic. I think, I don't, I, again, I don't remember my original answer, but it's therapeutic in some ways that I get, this is how I unwind, yep. um, no matter what's going on. Uh, and I always feel, and I don't know about you, but I always feel, I know Travis, for sure, this is you, the, the urge to create and to, to, there's a story somewhere that I want to talk about or tell or craft um, and try to get that out of my head. That's the hard part, I think, for, for many of us to get it out of our heads and onto the paper. Um, and usually it's not nearly as grandiose as it was in our heads, but it's, it's, it's always the attempt. You know, it's interesting you say that. I, I think this is true, both you and Travis. You've got stories to tell, and they're inside, and you got to get them out. I think for me, I want to... Um, Raise his pinky, Ben. Sorry. I want to commemorate something. I want to, um, I don't know, pay homage to something. I don't know that I necessarily have the stories. <laughs> uh, That's, yeah. nice. That's great. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Perfect little it. character trait right there. Yeah. He's delicate. He's a delicate camp chef. <laughs> well, I, no, I wanted to say something. I want to say something profound, but I think I've lost it. No, sorry. no, no. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I just So what do you want to do, Patrick? What do you, so you you're saying that you, you I feel like you guys have a story to tell. I don't feel like I have a story to tell as much as I just want to commemorate a story I've seen or I've read or I've heard, I, I want to play That's along. Valid. You know what I mean? Uh, I feel like I want to take my, my bend on it. I want to, I don't necessarily have the invented story, but I want to record it somehow from my perspective. Hmm. That's very, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, you know, 
I'm sitting there I, thinking, well, what am I going to say on this one, this question? But then I realized, you know, as the older I get, it's not as much as I want the world to see what I do. I want my grandchildren to know what I did. A legacy. And, it, well, it is a legacy in its own way. I mean, you, you know, your kids are young right now. How old are they? Uh, mine are almost 10 and 11. See, 10 and 11. You know, I've got, my youngest is 11 and I've got grandkids and you know, my mortality, and, and, and but as I get older, I start to really think about it. Well, it gets, <laughs> it gets, the days go by faster and faster. Yeah. There are fewer ahead than behind, Travis. Sorry. I know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but then I think, how do I want Mark. people, how do I want them to remember me? Yeah. And this is a way for them to remember me. They can see what I saw in my sketchbooks. They can see what I, I designed and what I created and they get kind of get a feel of who I was and yeah, other people get to enjoy it and be a part of it. But like you said, it's actually more for a selfish reason. I want them to remember who I am because, you know, as you look back, eventually, you know, I know I, I can, I remember my great grandfather, but I don't know much about him. You know, and this is a way that I can ensure that my, my children or grandchildren or great grandchildren will always at least know who I was. That's good to leave that legacy behind. You know, and I think you're, you're, you, what you're doing with, uh, or what you've done with the, um, the lunch bags, Ben, and is very much the same thing. You know, you're creating a legacy for your daughters that they will share or hopefully remember. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it is, I think, and uh, as, as all three of us as dads, uh, as we approach Father's Day, I think it's also probably poignant. Um, <laughs> I don't get anything anymore. It's all good. Well, no, 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 <laughs> not getting anything, but the, <laughs> the idea of, of building into our children, you know, and they, the, the thing that I have feared, and I, I know many a father who have struggled with this, is that they've, they've done so much, but they just weren't there to really connect with their kids. I, um, and, I can relate to that. Yeah, and so finding ways to, to bring these things back to it. And so those lunch napkins um, you know, are ways for my daughters to know that not only, hey, there's some cool art, but you know, that daddy loves you, and this is why I've, I'm doing this every day for you. I hide their personalities in my art. See, I'm here listening to you guys talk about legacy and do things for your kids. And I'm sorry, art's for me. <laughs> That's all right. I'm so shallow. <laughs> That's why I like you. In the foil for all this for us. Yes. <laughs> no, the that's that's really sweet, you guys. I'm I've always admired what you guys do for your kids that way. It's an offshoot. I mean, art is for us. I, I agree. I won't say it's yeah. It's, yeah, it's very much for us. Yeah, but we found ways to bring them in along <laughs> along the journey <laughs> and warn them not to get into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away. Stay away. <laughs> On that note, we probably better wrap up, you guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can talk all night to you guys. <laughs> but we do appreciate uh, the time that you spent with us today, Ben. We know you're spending quality time with the family and took a good moment to uh, draw with us. So we appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you same, for having me. Same with you, Travis. I know you got the busy work schedule. So it's been a lot of fun, you guys. It's been um, great today. Hopefully this uh, conversation and this little bit of drawing is inspiring to those that are watching or at least still watching. So, so. Um, with that, just, just to finish off, uh, Ben, anything you want to pitch or where people can find your work? Uh, I'm on Instagram, just my name, Ben Rizbeck, R-I-S-B-E-C-K. Uh, you can find me that way. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. I love to, to talk with people, see your art, and make some new friends. So, Good deal. And uh, me, you can find Patrick Scullin on Instagram, you, Trav. I was Jay Hansen on Instagram or uh, Life of the Party on uh, Facebook. All right. Well, we're going to okay. sign off, you guys. Live long and prosper. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>